Hey, this is Barry from Grace Point, and before we get to the message, we want to tell you about something brand new that we are starting. We are answering people's questions about life, marriage, family, the Bible, God, uh, current events, and we're going to videotape them and put them on our new YouTube channel. So if you'd like to subscribe and watch and listen and learn, go to YouTube, type in Grace Point Kitsap, and then push subscribe. Right now, we want you to join this message, and we pray that it will encourage you and inspire you and help you in any aspect, wherever you are on this journey of faith. I'm so excited. This is part two of six uh, in our series of Unleashed, part two of six. The first two parts started last week. We're building a foundation of a theology of worship, what worship is and why it's important. It's really, it, it really imperative that you make sure that you watch both, listen to both. And then starting next week, we build on top of that foundation of how worship is commanded and described in scripture. So we gotta have the what, and we gotta have the why, but then it's the how we, we worship. And I'm um, already finished with uh, part one, two, three, and four, and I wish I could preach all of them today, but we won't do that. So you gotta keep coming, gotta keep coming. Now let me explain something about this word unleashed. Unleashed does not mean that there are no guardrails in corporate worship. Unleashed doesn't mean there are no guardrails when it comes to corporate worship. That's what the whole series is about. When we gather together corporately, it mean, doesn't mean just do whatever you want. No, read 1 Corinthians chapter 14, describes the problems in corporate gatherings when there's all sorts of crazy things going on and how distracting it is to the teaching of God's word. So there are, doesn't mean there's no guardrails. What this series is, is we have, humans have, traditions have, churches have added guardrails within the confines of scripture and we've gotta, we've gotta remove those. We've gotta remove those guardrails that limit us, leash us in what the scriptures say uh, to do when it comes to worship. So make sure that you clearly understand that. And just as the word leadership can be really described in one word, it's influence, leadership is influence, worship with all the meaning, all the words, we can describe worship is, in one word, response. Our response to what God has done. And as we talked about last week, if we fully understand and grasp the glory of God and the grace of God, it should unleash worship to a worthy, worthy God. So now what we're gonna talk about today is part two of the foundation is this. Now, what does worship matter? Why, is, why, why does it matter? Here's the first part. Worship matters because it is what you were made to do. What you were made to do, we talked about last week that we are hardwired by God to worship. And if we miss this, we, we miss why we're here. Instead of God redeeming us and saving us and we experience the glory and grace of God, he just takes us home. No, we stay here to do a lot of things and one of them is to worship. God hardwired us to worship. I love Colossians chapter 1 verse 16 and we're going to walk through that book. It's beginning in January, but it says that you and I were made by God and for God. By God and for God. And one of the things that he made us for is to worship him. The second reason why worship matters is this. Worship is a witness to the world. Worship is a witness to the world. If you find something you really love, a restaurant or a place, and a vacation spot, you, you got to share it, all right? You're sharing something important to your world around you, and worship is a witness to the world. 
Uh, Sally Morgenthaler wrote this great book called Worship Evangelism, and she said this. She says, our worship of God either affirms or contradicts our message about God. Oh, I love God so much. He's so important to me. Okay. Our worship will either affirm that or contradict that. Unbelievers in the church and outside the church, unchurched as well, will draw lasting conclusions about the veracity and uniqueness of our God based upon what they see or do not see happening in our weekly church services. Man, this is so incredibly true. We can say, I love God. He means so much to me. I, I, I love him so much. But if we don't express it, people are like, I'm not really sure you really believe that. See, when we come on Sunday mornings, the whole morning is a a response to who God is and what he's done for us. So when we gather together and we are responding in worship by greeting one another and warmly welcoming those around, and you like have no idea what their week was, but you say, hi, friendly, and you're like, no, no, wait, that's not my job, that's guest services job. No, no, no. Worship begins before we even come into the building and begins before one song is even played. That, that is making a statement to someone. Maybe you've ne- they've, this is the first time here. You have no idea why God brought them here. But you're already responding in worship. That means something. Then when we respond in the singing of worship and you're fully expressive and you're responding, that is a witness to the people down the aisle, the people that are behind you And they're watching, especially someone who's on the outside looking in. Is this really important to them? Do they really mean it? And then when it comes to the teaching of God's word, if we're responding and we're engaged and we're right there and we're agreeing and and when when God's truth is, you know, powerful, you respond and, 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 and you're clapping like, yes, I agree with that. All of that is making a statement. I still remember, I still remember I was a little boy about this high, and I'm in church, my church in San Jose, California, I still remember it had uh, metal chairs, and I'm bored, and as a little boy, I vividly remember thinking, I don't know if I'm into this, I don't know if I want to keep doing this, and we're standing, and then I had a thought, I wonder if my dad's really into this. Because if my dad is out, I'm out. If my dad's all in, I'm in. And I remember turning and looking up to my dad. And he's singing a song. And let me explain that. He's making noise. <laughs> my dad was partially deaf in one ear and he couldn't carry a tune at all. And he is so engaged in worship, singing like the old rugged cross. And I still remember the little boy went, I'm in. I'm in. He affirmed by his expression, his belief about God. It is a powerful influence, people. It is a witness. A witness. If you're taking notes today, here's a central point. All worship involves sacrifice. We're going to talk about a sacrifice of praise today. All worship involves sacrifice. All worship involves sacrifice. Go ahead and turn to Hebrews chapter 13, if you would. Hebrews chapter 13, if you have a copy of God's word. If you don't have one, go ahead and grab a Bible in the back. You can go ahead and get up and do that. Hebrews 13. Let me ask you this question. Could you, Alex, could you put that uh, phrase back up there again? Um, say this word. One more time. How many of us, like, really enjoy sacrifice. We love pain. We love being uncomfortable. We love paying the price. We love the price being more expensive than we originally thought. How many of us enjoy sacrifice? You know what? But we do it for two reasons. We will sacrifice if it's important I mean, if it's worth it, or if they are worth it, we will sacrifice. If it's, if it's worth it, 
or if they are worth it. It is a sacrifice to get in shape and lose weight. It is, it is a sacrifice. You gotta get up when you don't wanna get up. You gotta do things that your body doesn't wanna do. You gotta sweat, you gotta pay that gym fee. You, you gotta you know, be uncomfortable. And, and then when you do it and you notice, oh, I, I feel better, my clothes fit better. It's worth it, I'll keep sacrificing. Last year we went, uh, the first part of our sabbatical I went to um, a wonderful worship experience. I visited uh, the San Francisco 49ers new stadium. (laughs) And we're like, oh, there's a fee for the tour. Absolutely, I'm gonna pay that price for the tour. And it was at 10 o'clock in the morning, it was like 98 degrees. Later that day, it was 115 in my hometown. Never been that hot before, but I'm sweating like crazy. Why? It's worth it. To me, oh, I'll pay that fee. Oh, there's a museum of all great 49ers. We will be going through the museum. We will take the time because it's worth it to me. And then we went to the team store. I had to go to the team store. And I don't, I don't really spend much money on clothes. Our food budget money usually goes, 95% of it goes to the women in my life. But on that day... I found a shirt, a T-shirt, and if I, if I spend anything more than 15 bucks on a T-shirt, I'm like, I don't know, I don't know. I spent 40 bucks on one T-shirt. <laughs> and you say, is it worth it? To me, it's worth it. See, we will sacrifice if it's worth it or if they are worth it. When we go, we're going to invest and we're going to save and we're going to do overtime because we want to take our family a special vacation into a special destination and we'll, we'll work, 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 save, 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 save. And, and then when you do it, you're like, is it worth it? Yes, it's worth it. My kids are worth it. My wife's worth it. It was worth it. We'll sacrifice. A couple years ago, my wife went off to her sister's wedding in Virginia and remodeling our, our, our bathroom and and I wanted to surprise her with heated floors, and uh, the cost was more expensive than I originally estimated. And now uh, every day for, for a week, I would come home at five from working and stay up till two, three in the morning to get it done to surprise her. It's still worth it. It's still worth it. Why? Because she's worth it. See, you and I, in all areas of our life, we will sacrifice if something is worth it. That's where the word comes from. It's worth it. They are worth it. So what we see here, this whole today is we do this. It involves this in two ways. Jesus sacrificed. And that's why we worship. Start with there. Jesus sacrificed. Because of his sacrifice on the cross. Everything changes for those of us who who trust in Jesus. And in fact, Peter writes about, describes us who have trusted in Jesus and received what he did on the cross for us. He says that you are, those who are followers of Jesus, you are a chosen people. You are a royal priesthood. One, you're part of God's family, so you're royalty. But a royal priesthood, meaning we have direct access to Jesus. We don't have to go through a human priest. We're just like, we're a priest. We, we have access to God, in, uh, part of his royal family. You are a holy nation. You are God's special possession. I mean, all of this has changed because of Jesus' sacrifice. The verse continues. He, does, he calls us all this, that we may, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful life. His sacrifice made all of this happen that we may then celebrate by praising him. First goes on to say this, once you were not a people, but now you are because of Jesus. You're the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, Now, you have received mercy. Mercy means the judgment, the damnation that we deserve has been removed from us. And it all goes back to Jesus and what he did. Because because of his sacrifice, this is what we do called worship. 
And for some reason, makes no sense. For some reason, Jesus sacrificed because he thought we were worth it. We haven't done anything worthy of it. But he sacrificed for all of this to take place. That's why we worship. All worship involves sacrifice. Louis Giglio has this amazing statement. It's so true. He goes, there is an unmistakable connection between our awareness of grace and our expression of worship. There is an unmistakable connection. Or there should be. If you and I have have an awareness of grace, that God has given what we don't deserve, he removed what we did deserve. That's grace and mercy. But if we have an awareness of this, there should be an incredible unleashed expression of worship. If we really understand grace, we should always unleash worship to a worthy God. I saw this in action a few years ago. I follow a number of churches. I, I want to learn and be stretched and grow and also see what's going on. And I, I came across this church, and of all places, Sin City. Las Vegas. And every time I watched, they would they play the whole service, and they, they would, oh, every service, every single so- Sunday, they have a testimony, a video story of someone. I was on drugs, I was on crack, I was in the gutter of life, and then I met Jesus. And, and you can't even recognize the person now. I, I, was, I was on the strip, and I was a stripper. And I was addicted to crack. And I was in bondage to my pimp. And then I met Jesus. And now I'm leading a Bible study. And my life has fully changed. I was in prison. I was this, I was this. And then I met Jesus. I met story after story after story. And then a couple years ago, we went to Las Vegas. My wife and I, I'm like, I've got to go to this church. I've got to see for myself. And as we pulled in to the parking lot, um, the, the parking lot attendants looked like prison guards or ex-prisoners. They were huge. Their muscles were ripped. They were tatted all up. And I'm going, should we keep going? And we pulled up, and then I looked in their face, and there was joy. There was happiness. And this huge guy leans up to the window to point me where to park. He's like, welcome to Central We're so glad you're coming. Why don't you turn over there and go over park over there? So glad you're here. Yes, sir. (laughs) You know, and then I saw about 10 different people, again, all tatted up, and they're just like, come in, come in. I mean, worship was happening in the parking lot. Then I go into the lobby, and there's men and women, and you could tell, whoa, there's been a transformation. And there's this huge sign, welcome to Central, where it's okay to not be okay. And then we walked into the room, and I was more people than I ever saw or experienced online. There were thousands and thousands and thousands of them. We're about 30 rows back, and I've never experienced the music being that loud in my life. 30 rows back, every beat, my my shirt was doing this. (laughs) I was like, it's going through me. I'm like, how am I going to be able to hear myself sing? And all around me, as loud as it was up there, they were pouring out unleashed worship to God. They didn't care. And it was, it was so loud of singing. And I leaned over to my wife and I said, they get grace. They get grace on a whole other level and they cannot help but express it. Right there. They know what Jesus sacrificed and, and then the freedom that his sacrifice gave them. If we get grace, it should show up in our expression of worship. In Hebrews chapter 13, this couple verses is really called the central text of worship in the New Testament. The central text of worship in the New Testament. In verse 15, it says, through Jesus, therefore, Let us, okay, stop right there. New to Bible study, whenever you see the word therefore, you gotta understand why it's therefore. Okay, wait, 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 Jesus did something, and through him, we must do something. Whoa, whoa, whoa. 
through Jesus, therefore. And let's back up to verse 11. That's what how good Bible teaching does, Bible study does. Back up, see context. He says, the high priest carries the blood of animals into the most holy place as a sin offering, but the bodies are burned outside the camp. Now, this book is called Hebrews, all right? So guess what they are? They're Hebrews. They're Jewish. They understand exactly what the author is writing about all of the, the, on the Old Testament law, the, Old Test, the, the, the high priest, when they were in the, in the desert, they would take an animal, a, a, a lamb, a spotless lamb, and they would, they would kill the lamb, drain its blood, and then sprinkle the blood, and the blood was a picture of a covering of the sin of the whole nation and every individual for one year. That was called a sacrificial lamb. And then they would take the lamb and put it outside the camp and, and then burn the body. So the picture is a sacrificial lamb. You, have you ever heard of that phrase before? Oh, they're a sacrificial lamb. We, it's in our culture. Most people go, doesn't realize that's Old Testament, a picture. Oh, the sacrificial lamb. Jesus was the Old Testament picture of the sacrificial land. Verse 12, and so Jesus also suffered outside the city gate to make the people holy through his own blood. Picture the cross. The cross was outside the city. Don't go to Jerusalem and, oh, this, this crucifixion happened inside the city. It was always outside the city on a major road that led, I believe, to the road to Damascus. So everybody will walk by and go, you don't want to mess with Rome. And Jesus, here's a picture outside the city. His blood represented he was the sacrificial lamb to not take away our sins for one year. But if we trust in him, he'll take our sins away, the punishment of our sins away forever because he's the forever sacrificial lamb. Only died once, gave his life once and for all. That's the picture he says, then let us, verse 13, let us go to him outside the camp, bearing the disgrace that he bore, for we do not have an enduring city, but we are looking forward to the city that is to come. He's talking about heaven because of what Jesus did. Through Jesus, verse 15, through Jesus as a sacrificial lamb, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise. The fruit of of lips that openly profess his name, meaning we actually have to respond with our mouth. We have to say it and praise it and exclaim it and like, yes, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Do you see the picture there? Because of the sacrificial lamb, we give sacrifices of praise to the lamb. Because of the sacrificial lamb, we give sacrifices of praise. All worship. Involves sacrifice. Goes on to say in verse 16, and do not forget to do good and to share with others. Meaning the, it's not, we just don't have a relationship with Jesus. Our worship is not only to God, but it affects everybody around us. We share, do good, for with such sacrifices, God is pleased. God is pleased. I'm going to break apart a couple words. Because of Jesus being our sacrificial lamb, lamb, let us continually offer sacrifices of praise. Continually offer sacrifices of praise. He sacrificed for us. We get to sacrifice praise to him. But it's continually. It's consistently. It's on a regular basis. It's habitually. It's not one and done. It's like all the time. I'm going to continue, 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 continue to offer sacrifices of praise. Continue, continue, continue. Why? Because it never gets old. My sins are forgiven. But my, my judgment has been taken away forever and ever and ever. So I'm going to continually offer sacrifices of praise. Continually offer. That means I willingly give it. Not begrudgingly, I willingly, continually give sacrifices of praise. But I just did that last week. I'm going to do it again. I'm not even in church. I'm going to give it again throughout the week. Give praise, give praise, give praise, give praise. Because of his sacrifice, I've been set free. Because of his sacrifice, I've got mercy. The judgment has been removed. Because of his sacrifice, he gave me grace I don't deserve. So I'm going to continually offer sacrifices 
back to him. Why? Because he's worth it. What he did was worth it. So I'm going to give, give it to him because he thinks it's worth it to him too. And it's a command. And some of you were ready to respond and you held back. You leashed it. You're not doing it to me, people. I'm going to teach you, you're not applauding for some dude up here that's a sinner just like you. The truth is what we applaud. So don't leash it. Don't leash it. So let's break down what sacrificial praise, sacrificial praise means. Um, I believe today we're going to talk about two ways we sacrifice and give praise. First of all, we, we got a sacrifice of ourself. Sacrifice of self. Starting with Worship involves my time, and I'm going to sacrifice my time. Thank you for being here today when part of you maybe wanted to be home and watching TV. I'm going to sacrifice my time because Jesus is more worth my team playing. I'm so thankful that God invented DVRs. But even if there were no DVRs, and even if I wasn't a pastor, I would be in the presence of God, gathering other pe- with other people, sacrificing my time to worship who God is worthy. I'm going to sacrifice my pride. And this is where we kind of lose it. I'm going to sacrifice my pride. I'm going to worship God. And I don't care what people think. We talked about that last week. I'm, I'm going to raise my hand. I don't care what people think. Hopefully I put deodorant on. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sacrifice my pride, and I, I, I'm going to move because, yes, yes, I may even do this. I mean, woo, I may even do this. And I'm like, uh, my pride is like, I'm not caring what people think. I'm more concerned about what he thinks. And, and then there's times where I'm like, oh, my goodness, I'm going to fall to my knees because I'm just overwhelmed with his grace. And, I, oh, I can't do that because what people think, who cares? I'm going to fall on my, on my knees. Sacrifice, another thing, I gotta sacrifice, you gotta sacrifice, because we're in this consumer mentality culture of America, and we've carried it into our gatherings, that it's a consumer mentality of, it's all about what I like and don't like. And I'm gonna make decisions based upon what I like. Oh, I, I don't like that, so I'll go over here. I like this part of this church, so I'll go over here, and then I'll go over here, I'll go over here, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna, and it's a consumer mentality, I gotta sacrifice that, I gotta get rid of that. It doesn't matter what, what, I, what I like and I don't like. Oh, I like that song. I don't like that song. I don't like that song. I don't like that song. Part of that's our preferences. I gotta, we got to sacrifice. i got to sacrifice my personal preferences. Oh, why is it so dark in here? I wish it was lighter in here. Well, okay, i got to sacrifice that. What, what, uh, lights. Why do, they, why do they have to have lights? Why, moving. Oh, I don't like that. i got to sacrifice my personal preferences. i got to sacrifice that. Why do we have to sing that song? Why do we have to sing that song again? What happens is we, this, this, cult, uh, this consumer mentality creeps in and it leashes our worship because it all, becomes all about us instead of all about him. Uh, Francis Chan, when he was a pastor, he goes around speaking and writing books now, when he was a pastor, someone in his church, some random churchgoer, comes up to him after the service and says this, I didn't enjoy worship today. <laughs> I've heard that before. I didn't enjoy worship today. With which Francis replied, that's okay, we weren't worshiping you. (laughs) Woo! Right? There's a phrase I've heard a number of times. A number of times, it's this, talking about our church. There is coming a day where I will hate the style of worship at my church, but I will still choose to worship. It's about our, I've heard this phrase about our church. Who said that? Oh, sorry, to me. <laughs> and I mean that. And there are Sundays I wrestle with that. And I, don't like it. I don't like that song. So what I do is I fight my selfish urgings. And I have to close my eyes. I'm going to focus on the truth of the words that are up there. And I start worshiping like, yes. Yes, that's true. Sacrifice of self. Many times we don't even get past that, so therefore we don't offer sacrifice of praise. There's another sacrifice that's more difficult, even more difficult. 
That's the sacrifice in suffering. Sacrifice in suffering. Because when we suffer loss, when we suffer pain, when we suffer, I'm, God, I'm so confused with you. When we suffer, why? Why not? How come? When we, sac- when, when we, we suffer a whole different things, we, we don't feel like worshiping. And many of us, we don't. Because I'm mad at God. Or God's confusing. And I don't think I'm going to go today. Because I'm hurting. And that's the worst decision. The best decision, you come and worship in spite of suffering. In spite of suffering. Because it's easy to know and express God is good when the sun is shining, when the sunrise is spectacular, when my life is going well, and we're like, God is good all the time, and all the time, God is good. But we usually say that when it's sunny out in life, metaphorically. But then storms come, and confusion reigns, and it hurts, and I don't understand. But the truth of the matter is the sun is on the other side of the storm. The sun has not changed. The sun is still shining brightly. God is still good. But we sacrifice praise in our suffering. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to worship anyway. I'm going to hold on to the truth that God is good all the time. Even though right now it doesn't feel good right now. Most, you read David's Psalms, he's, he starts out, he's frustrated, he has questions, he's asking God, why can't you hear me? Why don't you do something? And he always ends in praise because he's going to God with his hurts, he's going to God in his sufferings, and it always ends up praising God. See, because God knows when we praise him, it does something inside of us. It's almost like it's unleashing all the pain and saying, God, could you take it? For just a moment even, that's what happens when we unleash praise in our suffering. And it's a sacrifice because we're going against our feelings. That's that the song we just learned today, that my my compass for north is not my feelings. You are my north. You are my true north. And my true north will never move. My feelings will. And if you can sacrifice when you're suffering in praise, Oh, that pleases your heavenly Father. That you trust me even when you doubt me. That you still believe in me. You're still praising me. Because Jesus was our sacrificial lamb, let us continually offer sacrifices of praise. So we're going to end today this whole thing of all worship all worship involves sacrifice. Let's focus on this first song of the sacrifice he made for your salvation. And if you're not trusting Jesus yet, you can trust him right where you're sitting today or standing in a moment. You can say, I can't trust you. That You did this for me. I surrender to you today because of your sacrifice on the cross. And even when I don't understand when it's hard, I'm going to choose to worship you and give you a sacrifice of praise. Would you stand with me as we close in prayer and begin to worship again? God, thank you for being our sacrificial lamb. Jesus, thank you. Jesus, thank you for your sacrifice and may you hear our sacrifice of praise. Wherever we are, you are worthy. You are worthy. You are worthy of our praise because of what you did for us and who you are. So we worship you now. In the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, we say yes, amen. Let's worship.